Is violent demonic possession real, like you see in the movies? Disclaimer, the following is opinion from personal knowledge, not meant to lower anybody's experiences. If you have a possession story, please contact me at ggdaniel at ghostwalks.com or on Facebook. Now we all know what it's like in the movies. Now everybody's going to go back to the quintessential possession movie known as The Exorcist. If you are not familiar, you've obviously been living underneath a rock. Because this movie is amazing. They might disagree with me on how scary it is, but for the time, it was terrifying. In fact, part of their advertising uh, method was to show how it was scaring people to sickness, how ambulances were coming to the theaters to pick up people who were just scared too much. Now, there are many things that emerged from the movie The Exorcist. For me personally, it was the for lack of a better word, the demonization of the Ouija board. But that's another podcast for another time. Today we are talking about, specifically, possession. Now the movie The Exorcist did to possession what it also did to the Ouija board. It created a fear surrounding it. Because here's this nice young girl, teenage girl, that is possessed by a demon and turns into the demon herself. It is extremely scary. And what happens to her from the spinning head to the vomiting pea soup to the peeing all over the floor in front of her mother's friends, all of this creates fear. But is this true possession? Now, the simple answer to that for me is no. What do I think possession is? What have I experienced in the past? That's what I'm going to discuss today. I'm going to start with the easy stuff in the moment and talk about what I believe possession really is. Now, just like in the movie The Exorcist, the idea that an outside entity has taken over this young girl and the young girl doesn't exist anymore. That's what the movie The Exorcist is trying to portray. But is that truly possession? Because here's the thing. The question I've always asked as well, where do you go? Now, you are inhabiting your body. If you do believe in the idea of energy being ghosts and that our energy, our spirit, or our soul, whatever you want to call it, exists inside our physical body or what I like to more believe is gives us material form is what we actually are if an outside energy were to come inside and take over where do you go now you 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 form your material your spirit is who you are this is what gives us life so the fact that you're in there means that unless you were pushed out and you're you're living without a body which I don't know how possible that would be. You're there. Now, in the movie, and the idea of exorcism in general, this is somehow pushes your spirit down into a sub nether world, and that your body is on uh, completely under the control of the demon or the spirit, and you're just kind of like trapped, like in a room or a pit or something. Again. Don't fully believe that because you are what makes up your body. So with that in mind, what do I think possession really is? Now, my experience, what have I seen, is the idea that an outside powerful energy, not talking about your subtle ghostly experiences with, for the most part, 80% of ghostly experiences are on the subtle side. Now, I'm talking about a more powerful entity. Now, I've come across these in my experience as an investigator. These are the entities that are able to reach out to you the night before an investigation to try and scare you into not coming or to stop you from coming and investigating them. These are also the entities that can bang on walls, that can move things around. 
These aren't the entities that you might consider residual where you might hear footsteps on the second floor of your house or you go upstairs and a light has turned on or a door closes. Those are the more subtle residual ones. I am talking about the entities that are more conscious in nature. They do seem like they are interacting with you and affecting you as such. So this is the outside energy that I'm speaking of. This is a true legitimate energy that exists in a space that is external to you. That's what I'm speaking of. So when that outside energy, for whatever reason it might have, and I'll get into a personal experience in a little bit. So whatever reason it might have will attempt to take over your material being, your physical body. So it's trying to, in a way, meld with your energy. That's how I see it. So what I've seen in the past in these experiences is that uh, the person who is having this occur will lose control of their physical body for some time. They won't be able to move their arms and legs. If they're standing, they'll stay standing. If they're sitting, they'll stay sitting. They don't fall to the floor or anything like that. Uh, so they lose control, unable to move. And as well, there's a shaking that's involved. Now, I've seen this on multiple occasions with different people. I've seen it with psychics and I've seen it with regular folks. And the shaking is the same. Now, the best way to describe it is if you had a fever. If you were running a fever and you had this uncontrollable shaking because of the sickness. Now, I don't see it as being something that the person can control. And in fact, watching it and how they're shaking, I know that they couldn't physically do that. It has to come from the inside out. So that's the shake, and I I don't know this for sure, but my guess is that it's the energy within you, who you are, trying to fight off whatever's trying to come in and take control, and that's I believe where the shaking comes from. It's a similar idea to that if you're sick, and your 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 immune system is trying to fight off the sickness. This is what I believe the shaking is again. I, I'm not a doctor, I'm not an expert on that subject, but that is my belief. And when it comes to the very end, when the possession finally passes, in a way it's kind of anticlimactic in, in the sense that, you know, in the movies, what happened in The Exorcist, uh, spoiler alert, if you for some reason hasn't seen it or haven't heard, the priests do the exorcism at the very end and the uh, younger priest, uh, the um, hero of the story in a way, uh, takes the demon into himself. <laughs> so it's like very, very uh, dramatic ending <laughs> to that story. The idea that the demon popped out of the little girl affected him and to stop the demon, which again, from the view of the paranormal, I doubt this would work, uh, is to jump out the window and down some breakneck stairs and and die. I don't think that would... I mean, just the thought of it from not just a uh, logical mind, but also from a... You know, if you look into the religious side of things, it's like, no, I think the, uh, the spirit, the demon, would have just risen out of him and went and possessed the next little girl on Ritalin using a Ouija board. So... I disagree with that, even though it was dramatic. And I tell you, you couldn't really end the movie any other way. I don't think that's happened. that happened in the real-life story of that little boy. Uh, but in real life, there really isn't that kind of dramatic ending. What I've seen personally in, this, in the sense of the psychic, the psychic was able to uh, push it away, and with the help of the second psychic. And what I've seen with regular folks is you just have to relax. You just have to calm down and allow your natural defenses, which is your own spirit energy, to push whatever it is away. Same thing with passing a sickness. Your immune system takes over and does as such. This will happen with the outside entity. Now, as a side note, I'm not sure how Ritalin or some type of uh, uh, brain-altering drug would change the situation that's the only element in the exorcism in the exorcist that i wasn't 
able to fully explain. Uh, now, if you've seen the movie The Exorcist, you're probably wondering what I'm talking about. It was in the book. In the book, uh, it does mention that Reagan, the little girl in the movie, um, and the, the main character was on Ritalin. So not just using the Ouija board, but on Ritalin, which supposedly stopped her internal defenses. Now, this is something that I don't think will ever be tested on the scientific side. I doubt very much scientists are going to get a little kid and put them on Ritalin and then try and get them possessed by a demon to see what happens. So again, we just got to sit back and guess what might have occurred. But I'm talking in the sense that I've experienced these type of possessions with non-drugged up people, adults and uh, teenagers. Now, I did mention the idea of not being able to move. You end up in some type of paralysis. And this is just a, a side note for my own personal uh, reasons, because I've experienced that as well. And it is factoring into my research into out-of-body experiences. I do see a, a correlation between sleep paralysis and what I've experienced with possession. Now, I personally have not had the experience of a possession occurring in myself. In those other situations, I've only witnessed it with other people. And for that reason, I can't say 100% that there is a connection. But from what I've seen, in the sense that first, you are paralyzed when it is occurring. And the second uh, level of that is relaxing to come out of it. So those two factors do tell me that there is some type of connection there. I'm not going to get too far into that and get into the weeds here because uh, I just want to stick with this one topic. But maybe in a future podcast, I might do a little bit of studying or I'll, I'll do a live read for the Ghost Guide Daniel YouTube channel and we'll, we'll go into that a bit more. But I do see a connection there. Just put that off to the side. Now, getting back into the idea of possession... You're probably screaming at your your iPods, or your uh, your MP3 players right now. You're probably screaming and saying, "Are your computers? You know, how do you know all this?" Now, I always like to give these opinions, but I also want to be able to back them up. I do have some experience in this. I've talked a little bit about the Merit House experience. I believe it's posted on the Ghost Walks page in the articles. Just search for Merit House. But as well, I've witnessed it personally. Now, I'm going to come to an experience that I had at the Custom House in my home city of Hamilton. Before I do that, I just want to mention a famous name, Lorraine Warren. Now, Lorraine and Ed, the Warrens, are the uh, famous couple that are featured in the Conjuring movies and in other movies such as Annabelle that have spun off from that. They were real people, and if you don't know, they were most famous for the Amityville House investigation. Now, Lorraine Warren came to Toronto for an event years ago, and when I was involved with the paranormal group at the time, uh, we were enlisted to help with some of the promotion that would be done for this event. So I got to personally meet Lorraine Warren. We actually got to go in there before the event was happening and to sit down just a few of us with Lorraine, uh, with her, uh, Ed had, had passed away at that point. So it was Lorraine and her son-in-law, Tony Spera. And we sat down got to talk to them for a little bit. It's one of the highlights of my paranormal career. I'll never forget it. But during the actual talk, um, something came up that was really interesting in relation to my topic of possession. She showed a video. Now, this video was featured in the, one of the Conjuring movies. I can't remember which one. It was when they were sitting in a room and um, they were watching uh, Ed and Lorraine were presenting these videos from their investigations. And actually, that was the uh, kind of Stan Lee moment. They, they actually had the real Lorraine Warren sitting in the room watching them as one of the guests. Of course, they didn't point her out or anything. Uh, but anyway, they featured a fictionalized version of the video that I saw of a farmer. Now, I don't remember the details behind this. I'm not going to guess. But basically, this farmer was supposedly possessed. They were filming some type of reaction that he was having. Now, it wasn't in the moment of the craziness. 
you might hear like exorcist type craziness. Although if I remember correctly, uh, Lorraine Warren did say that that kind of craziness did occur. This was more in a moment um, when he was just calm. Now it was very disturbing to watch. I will probably try and find the video for a future live read if I can, or at least the fictionalized version, and I'll compare the differences. But with this video, it was very disturbing because they were sh like straight on shot of his face and he just looked completely out of it. Like his eyes were sort of rolled up into his head. He was talking very slowly. Um, I, I really didn't really understand what he was saying. And as he was talking, uh, and Lorraine pointed this out as well, by the way, very believable woman. And keep in mind, too, when she was doing this discussion that at this point her mind was starting to fade a bit. That's why Tony was there to keep her on track. But it was a joy listening to her. She's wonderful. But she was like just talking about this uh, very convincingly and saying, OK, notice what happens to his face. And, and we all saw it. Like, I mean, this was on cameras done before. Like, it would be very difficult to fake this kind of thing. And a white cross appeared on his cheek while he was talking. Now, I really don't know what to think about this when I first saw it. It did kind of get me interested in possession in general. My thoughts now are more that the brain is a very powerful thing and that if this was a true possession, that it is very possible that kind of like some people can experience uh, stigmata where the... Uh, the wounds uh, from Jesus Christ appear on their hands. They've, the, the belief is so strong that they can physically change their bodies. And this is something that is highly believed in even nowadays when it comes to the idea of the law of attraction. So being able to physically change yourself and everything around you. But this is so powerful that it happens in the moment that, you know, maybe there's an outside energy that's causing this to occur or maybe it was just the person themselves and the power of belief and the power of their mind made it happen so i don't know in that sense my guess there wasn't in possession involved that it was just the person um at that level of insanity that they could make this occur to themselves so then the question now remains well if the possession wasn't involved there then what is my experience Mentioned the Merritt House thing. That was with Psychic Kate. But there was another experience. Now this happened in my home city of Hamilton. At a building known as the Custom House. And I have talked about this building before. It is a very haunted place. Unfortunately we don't do events and tours there. Hopefully in the future that might change. Because it almost got to the point where you could guarantee something was going to happen you know, every time we went in there that you could almost know that things would get stirred up. And for a two month block, this is going back maybe five years ago, for a two month block, the building sort of turned on us. It got very negative. Now this story could go a very long time. There's uh, other elements involved, but I'm going to try and take the bird's eye view just to give you the idea behind it. In, reg in regards to possession. So the building all turned uh, with a hunt investigation night that we were doing for the public. So there's about 50 people and many of them were wandering around the building. But at the end of the night, uh, many got together and we did a seance to kind of, you know, stir things up, uh, see what might occur after people can, you know, tell their stories and their experiences for the evening. Now, during the seance, I had a, a young lady start to shake uncontrollably. Now, we were using a communication tool. Disclaimer was the Ouija board. Second disclaimer, we were very careful with how it was being used. You might be having your personal opinions on it right now, and I completely understand. Uh, I've gone into great detail in the past about my thoughts on the Ouija board and its usefulness. Uh, check out the articles again on Ghost Walks. Just search for Ouija board. You can see some of that on there and some methods that have been put forth that have worked for us. 
the Ouija board had nothing to do with what occurred that evening, but it did give an outlet for the spirit to kind of show off what they were going to do. So this powerful energy comes in and starts circling the letters on the board, like showing off its uh, strength and power. And it stated that it was the resident ghost of the building, the dark lady. So as we're uh, talking back and forth, she's showing how angry she is. And um, I'm communicating with her. And then all of a sudden it occurs that young lady starts shaking, maybe 17, 18 years old. So I ended the seance and thankfully we had our psychic there. It was, it was Kate. You know, she's very experienced in this. Uh, she runs forward to do the clearing on the young lady. End of the night because everybody's freaked out at this point. And the next time I come in, it's about a month or so later, you could feel the building was different. And it was a problem right from the beginning. I had an experience with the door shutting on me while I was outside and it it, it latched. Uh, and if I didn't have the keys, I would have been locked out. Uh, at one point, um, it just like throughout the entire night, the tools weren't working. The building was kind of refusing to communicate with people, which that was my first experience with that happened again at other times. And I realized, OK, they know that we're trying to communicate with them in one way it can reach out and hurt us is by not talking and not just not talking, but blocking the energy of all the other ghosts from talking with us, too. And I warned people about this after this experience. But on that night, I had no way of warning them. But they did know. I, I let everybody know that the building was kind of in a strange sort of what I believed is because of what happened previously. So there was many warnings going throughout the night and even into the seance at the end of the night where we decided to try this again. So keep in mind, the entire night was completely uh, activity free, just quiet, a little bit boring. And some say I was telling ghost stories to try and keep people entertained. After all, it was an entertainment event. And it wasn't until the very end of the night that we sit everybody together, we get the seance going. And immediately, it was just, it was, it kind of made me laugh a little bit that immediately the board kicks on and uh, it's the same energy that's come back, circling the letters in a very powerful sort and claiming that it was the dark lady. So I had people in the group and I, I was going to stop the seance at one point. I asked a couple questions and it hit me. Maybe I should stop this because I know what was about to occur. There were uh, teenage girls in the group and then it happened. I'm not talking about one. I'm talking about three. So one girl starts shaking uncontrollably, a second one starts shaking uncontrollably, and then a third one. So ending the, the seance, again, I had the psychic ready, Kate. She jumps forward, and uh, Mars was there as well. They jump forward to start doing clearings and to calm people down. And uh, while they're doing that, it hit me. Now, I don't know if this is a message from on high, but... Something told me that I needed to resolve this. Uh, maybe it was a message from the dark lady herself. I don't know. But I had an idea of how I could do it. So what I, I did is I got a smaller group together. Now, I was very careful. I made sure there were no teenage girls because for some reason, I think because the dark lady was considered a teenager when she died, the legend behind her anyway, that she was reaching out to similar aged girls like herself and that's how she felt the connection was there so i made sure that in the smaller group that i gathered that there were no teenage girls and we did a small circle and sit in the middle we had the ouija board and we had some people to run it experienced people and i i did a mini seance and the first question i asked why are you so angry and the thing took off I mean, it was very, very clear as it spelled out the word poem. Now, this made sense to me, even though it might not have made sense to a lot of people, including the people on the board. There is an infamous poem, sorry, I'll say famous, historically famous poem known as The Woman in Black. Now, this is a poem written in the 1800s. Whether it's about a ghost or about uh, alcoholism is was open for debate. 
It could go either way. Again, I've talked about in the past, maybe in a future one, I'll continue on that idea of how belief in something could maybe manifest a spirit. I've seen experiences with that too. But she said that she didn't like the poem. I can understand that. The poem is very, very insulting. If it is about a woman and a spirit, it's very insulting. It basically called her the devil herself. I'm talking about nine feet in height, horns out of her head, hooves for feet. It's not very (laughs) complimentary. And she didn't like the fact that we were telling this poem on every single tour that was done through the building. So I, I, I said at that point, all right, I think I know how to resolve this. And I said to the spirit through the board, I said, we won't tell the poem anymore. I said, well, that's it. Poem is off the tour for this reason alone. And as if one final little goodbye, I hear a noise behind me. I turn around and guess what? A 16-year-old girl had snuck into the circle and was now uncontrollably shaking. But it wasn't the same thing, right? She ran out the front door of the building and vomited on the sidewalk. So it wasn't a full-on possession. I really do think it was just kind of like a final message from the spirit. So that is a kind of review of the experience I had in relation to a possession. You can understand if you look at the elements of what happened here, it does seem like an outside energy was trying to take over the person's living energy, but that their body fought fought it off because every single one of the girls that were being possessed started that uncontrollable shaking. And for the four that didn't throw up, that yes, Kate did help do with the clearing, that in most senses, if they just relaxed, that eventually the feeling would have passed, that their, in my opinion, living energy would have dispelled this external energy that was trying to take them over. Now, some people have asked the question whether this could be a light possession, but is an extreme possession truly real? And I want to end on this point because I want to kind of leave it open. I'm an open-minded person. I love hearing new stories, even though I believe something like I've stated today, I am opening open to changing my mind. So if anybody has any stories, I'd like you to contact me with them. I want to hear them. Uh, GG Daniel at ghostwalks.com or on Facebook, Ghost Guide Daniel. So could what have I experienced be considered light possession? Is it possible because I live in a country that is quite young, that we don't have the type of demonic energy that you might experience in an older country where more dark things have happened? And maybe like, you know, places like Italy or England Uh, they might have a different level of possession because their spirits are so much more dark. I don't know. Maybe maybe from my experience, it was just the light stuff and that our ghosts are kind of uh, kind of wimpy for lack, lack of a better term. But again, if you have stories, I'd love to hear them. So uh, finally, just I want you to check out the Ghost Guide Daniel YouTube page. Uh, There's going to be a related strange news live read titled Demonic Possession is Real, says Psychiatry Professor. I'm actually going to record that now. I'm looking forward to it. It should be up in the next day or two. And next week, I will open up about my first haunted house investigation. Was it Canada's version of Amityville? Okay, that's it, everyone. Thanks for listening, and I hope you have a spooky week.